Okay, so we're going to be starting uh, bone and bone physiology. Um, in lab, uh, you're probably doing appendicular skeleton. Does that sound about right? Or are you on the axial skeleton? I was tested on both of those last week or whenever it was the first uh, exam. Great. So you were tested on all the bony landmarks and sutures. Great. So for the lecture portion, we're not going to be holding you accountable. There won't be pictures on it. You're not going to have to name or label bones. Um, if you can mute yourself again, that would be great. Whoever's unmuted. Great. Just make sure your microphones are muted so it doesn't distort the sound for everyone. All right. So um, in terms of bone, bone is a very important structure and it's got super important uh, function for us. And we're going to go through quite a bit. Uh, generally speaking, the skeletal system provides support for your overall body. It will protect your internal organs. If you think about it, there is no other organ other than the brain that is fully encased by bone. So we, just based on that structure, we know that the brain is super important. If it's fully protected and encased by bone, there's no other organ that that happens to with the exception of maybe the spinal cord, which is fully encased by the 24 freely movable vertebrae, right? Seven cervicals, 12 thoracic, five lumbar. So that's 24 freely movable vertebrae. And the heart and the lungs are encased by bone, but not solid bone, right? You have 12 pairs of ribs, so things can still penetrate between each rib where those intercostal spaces are uh, that can damage the heart and the lungs. The bones will assist body movement because muscles attach to bones. When muscles contract, their contractile force is transmitted to tendons and tendons attach to the periosteum of the bone and will move the bone to create a range of motion. Also, Within bone, bone is like a reservoir. It's for mineral homeostasis. It stores and releases minerals. Um, calcium is a biggie, calcium and phosphorus. We'll talk quite a bit about calcium balance in the body and how the thyroid and the parathyroid glands uh, play an integral role in maintaining calcium uh, balance within the body and why we'll also talk about calcium's functions and the importance of having that mineral in the body, which is also important. And I think a few of the slides that I may have added revolve around that bulleted point, number four. Uh, it participates in blood cell production, which is what we call hemopoiesis. Hemopoiesis means blood cell production, which could mean red blood cell and white blood cell production. When we're talking about red blood cell production, specifically, we use the word erythropoiesis. In bone, bone has the ability of storing triglycerides in fat cells or adipose cells, and that is found in yellow marrow. So within the bone, we have red marrow and yellow marrow. And yellow marrow can actually be converted into red marrow on demand if the body needs to push out more red blood cells. We'll talk a little bit more about the bone marrow when I show you the structure of bone. Bone is connective tissue. And it is held in place by this matrix this intercellular matrix of collagen fibers embedded in calcium salts. 
the calcium salt, sometimes we, we refer to that as hydroxyapatite. And the collagen fibers are really important in bone because the collagen fibers are like the reinforcing rods of a building. And those reinforcing rods give the building a little bit of sway, a little bit of flexibility. Um, if you're ever on top of a, a tall building like the Empire State Building, uh, you could be on top of that on the observatory deck and you could still feel from the wind a little bit of sway. And that's due to the reinforcing uh, rods. In our body, the collagen fibers have that same function. When we talk about the skeletal system, we're talking about the bones of the skeleton, right? The axial and the appendicular skeleton, but also cartilage, ligaments, and other connective tissues associated with it. Bones can be classified by their shape. They can be classified by their internal tissue organization, as well as by their bone markings. Right, you kind of learn that in lab. Maybe something was called a process, or something was called a fossa, or something was called a foramen. Right. Um, in terms of internal tissue organization, uh, there's a difference between the osteon that is found in compact bone and spongy bone which has like more of a trabecula organization that's found more in the epiphysis of the bone. In terms of shape, we have sutural bones, irregular bones, short bones, flat bones, long bones, and sesamoid bones. So on the top left on A, you can see the sutural bones. There is the sagittal suture. You have the lambdoidal suture. You have the coronal suture the lambdoidal suture. When we talk about irregular bones, the vertebrae is irregular. Uh, short bones, the carpal bones of the hand and the tarsal bones of the foot are short bones. The flat bones could be the parietal bone. Uh, the long bone, very common, the humerus, the femur, the tibia, um, the phalanges, of your hand, even the, even the distal phalange of the pinky is considered a long bone. Yes, it's small, it's even short, right, in relationship to the humerus, but it's, classific it's classified as a long bone because it has the same parts as this long bone. It has a proximal epiphysis, it has a distal epiphysis, um, it has a metaphysis, proximally, a metaphysis, distally. It has a diaphysis or a shaft in between. As long as it has the knobby ends with the shaft, right, then that is a long bone. And then we have sesamoid bones. The foot has some sesamoid. Probably the most popular sesamoid is the kneecap, also known as the patella. And really the primary function of the sesamoid of the patella is to increase the leverage or to increase the fulcrum, if you would, in terms of strength, the quadricep muscles, which are your primary thigh muscles, go over the patella before it attaches to the tibial tubercle on the tibia. And this gives a little bit mechanical advantage to give good strength to the quads. It's so much stronger with that sesamoid bone than without it. Okay, so these are just a few other examples of short bones, the ankle, which has the tarsals, the wrist or the carpals, flat bones would be the skull, the sternum, the ribs, even the scapula are also flat bones. The long bones are long, thin, they have the proximal and distal epiphysis. They're found in the arms, the legs, the hands, the feet, etc. Sesamoid bones, the biggie is the uh, patella, uh, but the hands, and the foot have very, very small sesamoid bones in them. So the long bone has a few characteristics to it that I mentioned. You have two epiphysis, right? One at the proximal end, one at the distal end. 
you have two metaphysis, again, one at the proximal end, one at the distal end. You have one diaphysis, which is the shaft. Then in long bones, you have articular cartilage, which is found at the both ends, the proximal and distal. Articular cartilage is designed to reduce the friction between two adjacent surfaces. And there will be synovial fluid circulating between those articulating surfaces. The periosteum is the connective tissue that surrounds the outer part of the bone, whereas the endosteum is the inner part of the bone. And the medullary cavity is specific to the hollow space within the shaft of the bone or the diaphysis. You can click on this link on your own later in the PowerPoint to look at the bony structure and tissues. But here's a great visual of long bone. So you can see the proximal epiphysis at the top, but at the bottom, there's a distal epiphysis. Then you have a proximal metaphysis. Meta means after. And then you have a metaphysis at the distal end. And then the space between both metaphysis is referred to as the diaphysis. You're gonna have spongy bone at the proximal epiphysis and the distal epiphysis. Where we have spongy bone, there is red bone marrow. This is gonna produce red blood cells and white blood cells and plasma cells are gonna be formed uh, in the spongy bone, which is found at the proximal and distal epiphysis. Uh, you can produce uh, red bone or bone marrow is found in the sternum, in the pelvic bone, and in the spine, in the vertebrae, as well as the ribs, okay? That's where we have uh, red bone marrow. In the center here, where the diaphysis is, this hollowed out cavity, that's the medullary cavity. There's yellow bone marrow here, which is fat, uh, or triglycerides, which is stored energy. The inner lining of the bone is the endosteum, whereas the external lining is the periosteum. Peri's on the outside. Bone is vascular. It does have blood vessels. So when bones break, they bleed. And when they bleed, you'll get a pooling of blood around that area called a hematoma. Sounds like a blood tumor, like hematumor, hematoma, T-O-M-A. At the very end of the bone, you'll see that bluish gray outline here where it says articular cartilage. And you'll see it here at the bottom, articular cartilage. Um, the cartilage cells are there, and what helps them regenerate is movement. Whenever two joints, or not two joints, but two bones come together, this articular surface and this articular surface make a joint. And this fluid in between that joint called synovial fluid. And every time you move a joint, that synovial fluid circulates and it, it helps to nourish the cartilage cells. It nourishes them with nutrition to help them regenerate and repair. If those cartilage cells are not moving properly, then the cartilage cells can degenerate. Now, if you're not moving, if you think of someone that has degenerative joint disease, AKA arthritis, AKA DJD, degenerative joint disease, the joints hurt. They don't want to move very much. So it's this double-edged sword where when someone has arthritis or degenerative joint disease in a specific joint and they don't move, it progresses and gets worse very, very fast. Movement is really important. Just want to do some pain-free range of motion to circulate the synovial fluid so that the cartilage cells can get nutrition and rather than degenerate, they can regenerate and repair. And that's why aquatic therapy is so beneficial. Being in a pool and swimming moves all the joints of the body without the weight of gravity, without resistance of gravity. You just get the resistance of water, which is a nice thing. So yeah, articular cartilage is designed to reduce friction between movable joints. The cartilage that's found there is called hyaline cartilage, and it's found both at the proximal and distal epiphysis. The periosteum, as I said, is that dense, irregular, arranged connective tissue that you find on the outside of bone. 
it's where muscles attach to bone by way of tendons. Ligaments that go from bone to bone that keep two bones in alignment also go from the periosteum of one bone to the periosteum of the other to hold the two adjacent bones in better alignment. Here's a nice uh, picture uh, showing on the top again, long bone. Here is the proximal epiphysis and down deeper, if we look further distally where the diaphysis is, this is compact bone. It's more solid. And you can see the difference in appearance between what you find in the epiphysis, which is spongy bone here, where it does look like a sponge, this is all trabecula, compared to compact bone, here is where we have osteonts. And you will only find these osteont-like structure in compact bone. Again, red bone marrow is in the epiphysis and yellow marrow is found in the medullary cavity of the diaphysis. You can see a nutrient artery perforating through the periosteum. Um, so when bones break, they, they can bleed. But this, these uh, arteries, these blood vessels, are a way of bringing nutrition into the bones. We need to bring calcium in there. We need to bring potassium and phosphorus. A lot of the minerals are stored in the bone. Here's just real bone showing what it looks like. See how porous it is, how you have a proximal epiphysis. This structure looks very different than the compact bone here and here, which is solid. Bone is connective tissue, so it contains an abundant amount of this ECM, this extracellular matrix. Mm -hmm surrounded by widely separated cells. Now the matrix is made up of water, about 15% water, 30% collagen, sometimes some, some sources say about 33% collagen, and uh, 50 to 55% of the crystallized mineral salts like calcium and hydroxyapatite. Bone is made up of inorganic minerals and organic. The inorganic minerals, which is gonna provide the hardness of the bone, is the calcium, either calcium phosphate or calcium carbonate. When you look at calcium supplements, the calcium carbonate is probably the cheapest of them. Uh, hydroxyapatite is, is more expensive, but calcium carbonate is when they crush up um, shells, like oyster shells and things of that nature. You get calcium carbonate from that. The organic collagen fibers provide a degree of bone flexibility. So there is a degree of tensile strength that can resist the stretching or tearing or breaking, if you would, of bone. Now you can remove the minerals. I did this experiment with my son last year. And I said, take, um, let's take some chicken bones. So we went to the store, we found some chicken, we stripped away all the muscle, all the meat. And I said, let's put it in some acid. He said, well, what's an acid? So I had to teach him about pH, right? Anything from zero to 6.999 is an acid. And anything at seven is neutral and above seven to 14 is an alkaline or a base. So, let's put this bone in an acidic solvent. What do you think is acidic? He didn't know. So he went to the store and I said, how about Coca-Cola? You wanna put it in Coca-Cola? You want it in Pepsi? Pick your drink of choice. So we picked Coca-Cola. We put the Coca-Cola in an old pickle jar. We put the bones in there. Uh, sorry, the first step was we took uh, a pH strip to measure the pH of the soda. And it was like, I don't know, 2.5, 3.0, something around there. It was very low. And then we took a bone and put it in just water. And the water pH was at 7.0. So we let it sit in there for many days. And then we went 
in about a week later into the water. We dipped the pH strip in there. And I said, what's the pH of the water now? And he said, it's eh, like between seven and eight, somewhere around there. Okay. And then we closed up the jar. We went to the Coca-Cola. We dipped the dipstick into the Pepsi Cola. And I said, what's the pH of the soda now? And he said, oh, it's so weird. He said, what is it? He said, it's like 6.5. And I said, whoa, what happened? He goes, well, the pH went up. And I said, yeah, how did the pH go up? He said, well, something had to raise it. And that said, that's called buffering. Buffers raise the pH or can lower the pH. So I said, in this case, what is it that's in bone? What mineral is in bone? Calcium. Interesting. So that means that the calcium had to be removed from the bone and is now in the soda and it took the pH and raised it. Take out the bone. Let's see if it is as hard as it was. And guess what he can do with the bone? Rubbery. He can bend it. It was like, ah, you know, he'll never forget that because he learned through a practical method. So when you put something in an acidic environment, you can buffer that acid out with calcium. In fact, if you think of people who use antacids, right? Let's say they use Tums. What does Tums have in it? Calcium. So they're taking the Tums and the calcium, it's going in the stomach, which is loaded with hydrochloric acid. And what are they looking to do? Raise the pH to get rid of the heart burn. Okay, so bones are very important. We have minerals in there. And we don't want bones to be in an acidic environment. That's why you have to be really careful with the foods that you consume and focus on foods that are more alkaline forming and not acid forming. Now, there, that is different. Notice I said alkaline forming, not alkaline foods. There are foods that are acidic that are alkaline forming like lemons. Lemons are very acidic. It has a low pH. But if you start drinking lemon in water, and then you check your urinary pH, it'll go up. It'll go up 8, 9, 10 pH for sure. Okay, so when you look at foods, you want to have more alkaline forming foods. That's important. Um, Bone is not completely solid because it has these spaces in it for the vessel and for uh, bone marrow. Spongy bone has more spaces and your compact bone has few spaces. Again, spongy bone is at the proximal and distal epiphysis and the compact bone is more solid, not through and through, but the periphery is, think of it as like a, it's a tube right? It is actually easier to break a solid steel bar than a steel bar or iron that's a tube because it's almost like the tube has walls. Walls make it stronger. Exercise, hormones, and nutrition. Really important when we talk about bones and bone strength, vitamin C. No one really thinks of vitamin C when it comes to bones. Most people think a vitamin C to boost your immune system. When I'm sick, I take vitamin C because vitamin C helps to recycle glutathione, the most important antioxidant to humans. If you take a vitamin C pill and you crush it up into a powder and you bite into an apple, we know that the bitten part of the apple now turns brown. It oxidizes when it hits oxygen. But if you bite in the apple and take a little bit of that vitamin C and sprinkle it in there, it'll preserve it and it won't oxidize. It prevents the rust, if you would. Vitamin C is required for collagen synthesis. Now we know that one third of bone is made up of collagen. We also know that humans do not manufacture our own vitamin C. If it's not in your diet, you are deficient. The more stress that one is under, the more vitamin C you burn through. 
So you should be consuming vitamin C rich foods every single day. The pituitary gland and the adrenal gland are highly concentrated with vitamin C, but they burn through it very, very quickly. Those who smoke burn through vitamin C even faster than those that don't smoke because vitamin C is the antioxidant that's trying to counter the oxidative stress. Now, think of collagen is not only in bones, collagen is in the skin. So we know that those that smoke have accelerated uh, wrinkles and have signs of aging on their face. Now, if they have visible signs on the skin and on the face, what do you think is happening internally to structures with collagen? What's happening to their blood vessels that should have collagen in it? What's happening to the strength of muscles, tendons, and bones? They have to weaken. Okay. Vitamin A is important. It stimulates osteoblast activity. Remember the B in blast for building up bone? And osteoclast with a C, think of carving out bone. So the osteoblast builds up bone, the osteoclast breaks down bone. This beautiful dynamic relationship between osteoblasts and osteoclasts is what we refer to as bone remodeling. Remodeling is breaking down and building up, breaking down and building up, osteoclast, osteoblast, osteoclast, osteoblast. If there's more osteoclast activity, then bones are breaking down faster than they build up, and that's osteopenia or osteoporosis. Vitamin K and vitamin B12 help to synthesize bone proteins. Vitamin K does not get enough credit as it should. Vitamin K, we know that vitamin D is important, right? Vitamin D allows you to absorb calcium from your diet into your blood vessels. That's what vitamin D does. It helps us absorb calcium into our circulation. But how do we get that calcium that's in your blood vessels into the reservoir, into our bones? The only way that happens is we need vitamin K to do that. So what we were seeing and what we see commonly, and this is, uh, it's a real shame. It actually happened to my aunt uh, last year, a year and a half ago. She was taking statins for cholesterol. She has high cholesterol. And I tried to discourage her from using these statins because I know how dangerous they could be. I said, you really have to be careful with these statins. It's not good for the heart. It's not good for the blood vessels. But the doctor tells me I need them. I'm good. I don't want a stroke. I don't want a heart attack. Nonetheless, she's been taking it for about a year, two years, and quadruple bypass surgery. Quadruple. Four blood vessels clogged. Now, how can that be? How can that be? if she's on a statin, which is supposed to prevent clogging and calcification of the arteries. Well, what they discovered is that the statin drugs di diminish something called matrix G protein, or it's called matrix GLA protein to be exact matrix GLA protein. And the purpose of this matrix GLA protein is that it helps to drive calcium from the blood vessel into the bone. But it's vitamin K dependent, which means that the statin is blocking vitamin K. When you block vitamin K, this matrix GLA protein can't drive the calcium that's in the blood vessel into the bone. So guess where the calcium stagnates? in the blood vessels, and they call that vascular calcification. When the blood vessels become calcified, they can't dilate. And when they can't dilate, blood pressure goes up, it becomes a big, big problem. So vitamin K is very important in driving calcium into the bone. Used to be able to just buy vitamin D by itself, 
And there were these old JAMA studies in the Journal of the American Medical Association years ago that said, if you take vitamin D, you have to be careful because it causes high blood pressure. And there's a half truth to that. Vitamin D by itself will not increase your blood pressure. It's vitamin D, which helps you absorb calcium in the absence of vitamin K. Now you've absorbed calcium in your blood vessels, but have no ability to get the, blood, the calcium from the blood vessels into the bone. So blood pressure goes up due to vascular calcification. There's a problem. Okay. Uh, growth hormone and the thyroxin or thyroid stimulating hormone is very important. Sorry about that, let's minimize this here. So growth hormone, that means when you sleep, about 50 minutes after your sleep, your body produces growth hormone. And growth hormone helps to regenerate a lot of your tissues, muscles, tendons, ligaments, bone, your neurology. Uh, sleep is really important. You need a good seven to eight hours of sleep for your glymphatics not lymphatics, glymphatics. Glymphatics is this circulatory system in the brain that allows eight hours to allow the brain to flush itself out and to rid itself of toxins. So sleep is important for the glymphatics. It's important to produce growth hormone to regenerate so many parts of your body. But if you eat a refined carbohydrate before bedtime, if you have a sweet tooth before bedtime, if you have a cookie or ice cream or cake or some chocolate, something before bedtime, you block the growth hormone receptors. So you wake up in the morning just as tired as you did when you went to bed. We're gonna talk about uh, estrogen and testosterone a little bit. They help to stimulate the osteoblasts to build up bone. And then we'll talk about calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. Uh, calcitonin is a hormone produced by the thyroid and parathyroid hormone is produced by the parathyroid glands. So this is just a good review of some of the things that we spoke about. This tells us the primary source of some of these hormones as well as the effect on the skeletal system. So calcitriol is what we refer to as vitamin D. Vitamin D, remember the UV rays hit the subcutaneous cholesterol on the skin. It makes these vitamin D precursors. It goes to the liver first and makes these vitamin D precursors, which go to the kidneys. And the kidneys then produce the bioavailable form called calcitriol. Growth hormone is prim the primary source of that is the anterior pituitary gland, which stimulates osteoblast activity, again, building up bone. Thyroxin, which is T4, thyroxin, which is T4, with growth hormone, also stimulates osteoblast activity to build up bone. Uh, the ovaries and the testes, ovaries produce estrogen and the testes produce androgen, also stimulate osteoblast activity. Everything is building and building and building up bone. Well, what works at breaking it down? Well, PTH, parathyroid hormone, PTH is produced by the parathyroid glands. So the thyroid gland is in the throat and it looks like an H. And on the posterior side of the left and right lobe, some on the superior portion, some on the inferior portion, that's the parathyroid glands. And they're involved in stimulating osteoclast activity, which will elevate calcium concentration in the blood. So if serum or blood calcium drops too low and we need more calcium, your parathyroid gland kicks in and pushes out PTH. And you have these cells called osteoclasts that will degrade the bone and release the calcium into the blood. Calcitonin works the opposite. 
it's designed to lower the amount of calcium that you find in blood, and we'll show you how it does that. If there's an irregularity in some of these hormones, you can be too tall, you can be too short. If you're too tall, we call that giantism, and if you're too short, we call it short stature. Sometimes growth can be inhibited um, by the thyroid gland. Uh, this is something that a lot of pediatricians will assess in children where they will uh, check their height and weight and compare that measurement to other children in the United States. And we'll say you fall within the 95th percentile, the 50th percentile. So if looks like height, if a child may be short stature, it's really important to assess two things. Look at the pituitary gland, look at growth hormone levels, and look at thyroid, okay? It's usually one of those two. So here is short stature on the left. This is uh, normal uh, average height here. Then we see these long slender fingers. That's something different. We could see that in giantism. Here we could see pituitary dwarfism here. And here's the opposite. Here's someone that's super tall and slender, but this could be seen in a genetic condition called Marfan's syndrome. Marfan's syndrome is very, very tall, long, slanky limbs, muscle tone, pretty poor. Um, the height and the length of their bones is not the life-threatening portion to it, but it's really an elastic cartilage, an elastic elastin tissue issue where the elastin, the ability of the body to form um, parts of connective tissue that create strong tendons and strong ligaments is poor. And that becomes a problem with blood vessels. So people with Marfan syndrome can develop life-threatening aneurysms to major blood vessels. Let's look at the uh, four primary types of blood cells. There's the osteogenic cell known as the osteoprogenitor cell. These are stem cells that uh, have the ability to differentiate into other type of cells. The osteoblast with a B is a bone building cell that's involved in secreting the matrix. The osteocyte is a mature bone cell and the osteoclast is the one that's carving out the bone. It's involved in the remodeling, causing bone to release calcium into circulation. So we have an osteoprogenitor cell on the left, aka osteogenic cell, that can evolve into an osteoblast. This osteoblast is producing matrix. It's producing the ECM, the extracellular matrix. It's producing the matrix, so if I'm the osteoblast producing matrix around me, and that matrix and those calcium salts now harden, I become trapped in my matrix. I can't move anymore. And now I don't need to produce any more matrix because everything's calcified around me. So the osteoblast evolves and becomes this cell called an osteocyte that's involved in just maintaining the bone tissue. The osteoclast has a different type of function. It is a monocyte that has evolved into a macrophage. And this monocyte is going to release these proteolytic, collagenolytic enzymes to break down collagen and protein along this ruffled border. And that will start to destroy and carve out and break down the bone to increase calcium in the blood. Okay, so the osteogenic cell is your undifferentiated stem cell, that is your osteoprogenitor cell, and it can differentiate into the osteoblasts. The osteoblasts are designed to build bone, whereas the osteocyte is now the mature cell that arose from the osteoblast that's been trapped in that matrix that it produced. And when it gets trapped in its little matrix, it's now 
referred to as an osteocyte, but it gets trapped in a cavity called a lacuna. The lacuna is the cavity that it gets trapped. The osteoclast is the type of cell that has the ability to release these very strong proteolytic collagenolytic enzymes that release these acids that break down the bone. But they come from monocytes originally. Again, clearly differentiating the difference between uh, spongy bone at the proximal or distal epiphysis, that's spongy, and compact bone is seen more along the shaft of the bone. Spongy bone is a little bit lighter, whereas the compact bone is more for protection and weighs a little bit more. Again, another view. Here's spongy bone or cancellous bone in the proximal part. You can see how much thicker this compact bone is here and here. And inside is the medullary cavity, which is for bone marrow, but specifically yellow marrow. Up here in the proximal and distal epiphysis is where we have red marrow. So you can click on this to compare and see the difference between compact bone and spongy bone. Here, is compact bone on the outside here you see these osteons look like if you were to cut a tree down and you look down you see all these concentric rings and these concentric rings are called concentric lamellae and then you can see these little osteocytes here 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 these osteocytes are trapped in this cavity called a lacunae and it has these finger-like uh, extensions coming off of it, making canals called canaliculi, like this. And then in between these osteons, you have these interstitial lamellae, which are nothing other than um, remnants of older osteons. Because remember, bones are going through remodeling. They're being made and then they're broken down, made and broken down, made and broken down. So the ones that make complete circles, those are concentric lamellae, and the ones that are found in the periphery, just around it that don't make a complete circle, are usually referred to as interstitial lamellae. Right in the very center of each osteon is called a central canal or a haversion canal, sometimes called Volkmann's canal. And in that canal is where we have arteries, veins, lymph, and nerve. So blood vessels come from the outside, they break through the periosteum, and then go right through the center of the haversion canal, or central canal, or Volkmann's canal. And this is a way of bringing minerals into the bone or bringing minerals out of the bone. So again, the osteons are only found and seen in compact bone. When you get to where the end osteum is, this is more, tends to be more spongy. It forms a trabecula, which is much more spongy-like. On a microscope, again, this is what the histology of an osteon looks like. In the center is the haversion canal or the central canal. You have these concentric rings going around or concentric lamella. Then you have these black hollowed out holes. Those are called lacuna. And what sits in a lacuna is an osteocyte. Remember the osteocyte is a mature cell, which at one point was immature. It was the osteoblast that produced the matrix. And then you have those finger-like extensions called canaliculi. There is blood supply and nerve supply to bone. Anyone that's ever broken a bone would know that. Bones do bleed and they are painful. They are, uh, the spongy portion is highly vascular. That's where the, uh, the bone marrow is, the red marrow. And then we also have the yellow marrow, which is found in the medullary cavity. But on demand, 
if the body really needs to, it can adapt and become red marrow in crisis situations. Remember, red marrow is primarily found in the proximal and distal epiphysis, the sternum, the pelvis, and the ribs and the spine. You can click on these two links later. Wanted to talk a little bit about bone remodeling and Wolf's Law. Wolf's Law, this is one of the things that you know. It's just one of the things that you didn't know that you knew. Um, Wolf's Law states that if you don't use it, you lose it. And the more stress you put on your body, the stronger it becomes in all aspects, in many aspects. Um, astronauts know when they're in outer space and there's no gravity, when they come back, they have to give it time for their bones and muscles to strengthen again. Otherwise, they'll break their bones. The more stress there is on bones, the more stress that there is placed on muscles and tendons, the stronger they get. That's called Wolf's Law. Let's look at fractures. Uh, when bones fracture, they go through these uh, three phases, the reactive phase, which is the early inflammatory phase. Inflammation is good. It's the first sign of healing. That's where it gets red, hot, and swollen. The reparative phase, which includes the formation of a callus, usually a fibrocartilaginous callus first, and then it evolves into a bony, harder callus afterwards. And then after that happens, you go into this remodeling phase, which comes after the bony callus is remodeled and just continually builds up and breaks down and builds up and breaks down the bone. So we'll show you these different steps. Here is the bone breaks. And you can see that the blood vessels are ruptured here. And when that happens, you get a clotting of blood. And this is painful. I can tell you the only bone injury I had was maybe 20 years ago. Um, I was jet skiing on the North Shore in Oyster Bay, and I rode a wake that was very high after a tugboat came by, and my jet ski was probably eight, maybe eight to ten feet above water level. Now, when it came down, I should have known. I was still very new to jet skiing at the time, but what I ended up doing was I held on for dear life. That's like the reflex is to hold on. And I should have, you know, there's a little bungee cord that's attached to it. I just should have like fell back and that would have been the end of it. But I held on. And when, by the time the jet ski came down, the back hit and then the front, it threw me forward. And my knee just hit the side hull and I just went down. My chin hit. It was, it was a mess. The tugboat came around and they, they pulled me out. And... Um, they said, you know, we have to get you to the hospital. I said, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, no need to take me to hospital. They said, no, you don't understand. You're, you're bleeding from your face. I'm like, and I look down and I see, you know, blood dripping on the guy's boat. And I look at my knee and it's completely swollen. I said, oh my God, what did I do? This is, this is a mess. So they, they give me a rag, I'm holding it under my chin. Ambulance came and everything. I I signed the waiver. I didn't want to go to the hospital. I had enough close friends that were PAs and uh, nurses and doctors. So I just went home and uh, a few of my friends met me at the house and they just sewed me up. I did need stitches, which is why I have this goatee here. So they sewed me up uh, in the garage and, but my knee was swollen. It was, I felt a pulse in my knee. This is why I'm bringing up the story. So I feel this pulsing in my knee and I go, oh my God. And on my ankle, everything is swelling. So I drive myself, I go to uh, Zwanger Radiology and I have an MRI and it finds a hematoma. It finds this partial tear in the vastus medialis, which you learn when you cover muscles, it's one of the quadricep muscles. So it was a partial tear, not complete, but the femur had a slight fracture in it and it had this pooling of blood. And every time my heart beat, I could feel it in my knee. So 
immediately. I mean, very quickly. I remember I went from there and I went to the gym and I just wanted to do these minimal leg extensions because I wanted the bone proteins and I wanted the muscle proteins to start to form and to produce so that if there was stimulus that these actions were needed, it would redirect the right proteins of what needed to be made. So anyway, long story short, there's no, um, no weakness in the knee. There hasn't been any uh, knee arthritis, nothing like that. It just perfectly formed. And it took about four weeks, about four to five weeks, everything was healed up. But this step, the hematoma, painful, very painful. After that phase, you start to form this little like callus, but it's just fibrous. It's fibers. It's clotting and clotting and clotting this fibrocartilaginous um, callus. It's kind of weak and it's soft, but a lot of degrading is taking place at the same time. A lot of phagocytes and macrophages and phagocytic cells are in there to clean out the old debris, the old cells. Then the bony callus starts to form. That's about three to four weeks. And then after that, it goes through that bone remodeling where you got your osteoclast and osteoblast activity that takes place. Beautiful process that happens. But you have to be healthy and you have to be nourished with good vitamin D, good calcium. Inflammation has to be regulated just right. And uh, healing is just as strong when that fracture heals it's just as strong if not stronger after it breaks than it was before that's how beautiful that can happen so again these are the four different phases of how it takes place some of the different types of fractures that can take place when a bone fractures and then breaks through the skin ouch right that is an open fracture Communuted, I had a patient in my office that I've been treating now for the last few months that had a comminuted fracture of her proximal humerus. So we've been doing some soft tissue work and some cold laser therapy to help that regenerate and repair. About 72 years old, is about 95 to 98% recovered uh, with very limited, um, very limited mobility, meaning there's no... When I say limited mobility, there's no limitations to her mobility. So she's just about all healed up. A green stick fracture, very, very common, especially on the first day of school. I'm sorry, not the first day of school, not that one. Um, there is an epiphyseal fracture. Hold on, let me see if I have that one here. Then I'll go back. This one here, the epiphyseal fracture, this looks like it's the knee joint. This is the epiphyseal plate that's open. This is in young kids. So when this epiphyseal plate is fused, we know you're not growing anymore. When we see the space open, you're still growing. So you have to be careful. You know, when like uh, you see mom or dad or a couple and then the child is in between and they grab the kid's hands and they swing them like it's a swing back and forth. That can cause epiphyseal fractures easily. Excuse me, Professor? Yes. Sorry to cut you off, but someone just told me that they got kicked out, so they're waiting in the waiting room. Okay. Thank you. Mute yourself, please, Teddy. I'll mute. Okay, so the epiphyseal fracture happens also first day of school with young kids, kindergarten, first grade, mostly kindergarten children, where they have to take that first step on the bus big step up. That's where mom or dad, you know, they, they lift up the hands up this way. They lift up to get that first step. And that's where there's a lot of epiphyseal fractures in the shoulder or the forearm. So we have to be very careful with that. 
um, going back here to green stick, if you ever pick up a green stick, green sticks have a lot of flexibility. You can take a green stick from end to end then it won't break in half, but the convex side may splinter. So when it splinters only on one side and the concave side is intact, that's a green stick fracture. A POTS fracture is specific to the distal ankle. And these terms are just important to know because if you're getting into nursing and healthcare, when you see the word, oh, POT fracture, you'll just know, okay, it has something to do with the foot or the ankle. When you hear Collie's fracture, you know it has something to do with the wrist. The Collie's fracture is when the distal end of the radius fractures, but it dislocates a little bit posteriorly. The same exact thing with the distal radius dislocating anteriorly is called a Smith's fracture. So Smith's and Collie's is a little bit opposite. Another common one is a compression fracture. This happens when someone slips on black ice, they land on the butt, and then everything compresses. Their entire spine compresses, and the weakest vertebra starts to collapse, and it compresses. Usually in people with osteopenia or osteoporosis. Okay, now bones roll in calcium homeostasis. Calcium is really important. Uh, the, bo the bones are going to store 99% of the body's calcium. The parathyroid gland secretes PTH or parathyroid hormone when calcium levels in the blood drop and we need to increase blood calcium levels. These osteoclasts are stimulated to increase the bone breakdown and then the calcium is released into the blood. Parathyroid hormone also stimulates the production of calcitriol, which is vitamin D by the kidneys, to increase the absorption of calcium from your diet. Okay, so that's really important. Now, why is calcium important? Calcium is involved in many body systems. A biggie is nerve and muscle cell function. And I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail this is where some of the additional slides come into play. It's involved with blood clotting. Calcium is involved with prothrombin and fibrinogen turning into fibrin. And it's involved in many enzyme uh, functions in many uh, biochemical reactions in the body. Keeping the calcium level in this very tight, tight range, nine to 11 is critical if the levels go too high, the person can die of cardiac arrest. If it's too low, the person dies of respiratory arrest. So let's take a look at calcium. Now, I'm gonna simplify this because we're gonna get into this more when we do neurology, but we know that when we talk about a, the four different types of tissues, um, we said that there was epithelium, connective, muscle, and nerve. When we talk about the nerve, there was the neuron. And the neuron had dendrites, it had a cell body, and it had an axon. So this right here is the end of an axon. And at the very end of an axon is this axon terminal, which has these little small vessels in it, which were probably made by the ribosomes and the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum that makes proteins. And we know that one of the functions of proteins is that it can be packaged or repackaged by the Golgi apparatus, and it can be a neurotransmitter. So neurotransmitters can either be excitatory or inhibitory. A neurotransmitter is this chemical that can be released that can create an on switch or an off switch, stimulation or inhibition, one of the two. What releases the neurotransmitters are calcium. So calcium comes in and it tells this vessel right here that has this neurotransmitter filled vessel, okay, you're going to fuse with the membrane, you're gonna move this way, open up, 
and release the contents outside into this cleft, and that's called exocytosis. So calcium is needed to trigger the release of the neurotransmitter. If this was a muscle on the other end, the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is always an excitatory neurotransmitter at the neuro, at the neuromuscular junction where the nerve and muscle meet. Okay, acetylcholine is an excitatory neurotransmitter. I'll talk about another excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitter, but I wanted you to see calcium's role in releasing neuro, the neurotransmitter here. Okay. Here is a neuromuscular junction. In this case, here is a nerve. This is a muscle. If we take this box right here up on the top and we blow this up, we're looking at this. So here's the yellow and here's the reddish or pink. Here's the yellow and here's the pink. At the very end of this yellow is the uh, end of the axon. And you can see again, these neurotransmitters. And then this end is the muscle. So this is the neuromuscular junction. The neurotransmitter again is being released by calcium. It's gonna release its neurotransmitter in this space between the nerve and the muscle. And it just so happens to be acetylcholine in this case, because that's the excitatory neurotransmitter, ACH. You could see here that the synaptic vessel releases via exocytosis acetylcholine. And it's hitting this channel, right? Remember, proteins are channels. So it can hit this channel and acetylcholine says, open sesame, and the door opens. And it allows sodium to rush in like crazy into the muscle to allow for excitation, okay? So again, calcium is important because it initiates the trigger and release of the neurotransmitter. At the muscle level, it's acetylcholine. Calcium is also really important because calcium allows muscles to contract. We know that if there's too much calcium in a muscle cell, muscles are in spasm. So in the muscle, when we look at muscle at the larger, you know, larger scale, and then we start going more molecularly, microscopically, we have what's called a sarcomere, which is made up of these two contractile proteins. One is actin, which we can see down here. Actin is the thinner contractile protein. And the thicker one is myosin. And myosin and actin make a connection somehow. And calcium is involved in making those two contractile proteins interact and to contract, to create tension. It does so where if we look at this actin up on top, this is actin. And then you see there's another protein called tropomyosin. That's that purplish thin string. And then there's that like pink snowman looking structure here called troponin. What troponin is doing is it's keeping tropomyosin in alignment, in place, covering these black circles on actin. These black circles are referred to as a binding site. It's a binding site, which means something has to bind or connect to it, but it can't because troponin is actually blocking the binding site and troponin is holding the tropomyosin in place. But then comes calcium. Calcium comes in, it goes after the troponin like a staple remover, removes troponin, the staple, removes it, right? Troponin is the staple, but calcium is the staple remover. Comes in, calcium comes in, it removes troponin so that the tropomyosin can move and it shifts. And when it shifts, look what becomes available. Look what opens up. These binding 
sites are now exposed on actin. So now myosin can interact with that binding site and actually create contractions. Okay, we're gonna get into a little bit more detail of that when we get into the topic three, when we get into the third exam, which is purely muscle and muscle physiology. For now, I want you to understand that the sarcomere, which is the functional unit of muscle, has contractile proteins, which are actin and myosin. And then it has regulatory proteins, which is the on and off switch, which is tropomyosin and troponin. But calcium, its role is to remove the troponin and allow muscle contraction to take place. So when those binding sites are exposed, you can see here the binding of myosin to actin. This has like an arm or an extension that reaches up and finds that binding site. And after it finds it, it flicks like this. It just goes and it flicks that actin and creates a muscle contraction. Okay. So actin and myosin are the contractile proteins. Calcium is needed to initiate muscle contraction and calcium is needed also to allow the neurotransmitter, which is acetylcholine, to be released. Where does calcium come in again? There is another type of receptor called an NMDA receptor on the right, N-methyl-D-aspartate receptor, NMDA receptor. When these are too active, you can get neural excitability. These are children that can't pay attention. These are hyperactive children. These are hyperactivity, ADD, ADHD situations where these NMDA receptors are highly active, where you get this influx of calcium coming into the neuron and you get all this stimulation, all this excitability happening primarily because there's a faulty magnesium plug. So you see MG2+, plus, that's magnesium. We know that people take magnesium at night to sleep. We know women take magnesium during the time of month to make the uterus relax. That's why you eat dark chocolate during that time of month when you're having your menses. When muscle tension is too great, magnesium relaxes it. Why? Because magnesium creates a plug. It blocks this receptor so that calcium can't rush in. Magnesium is a natural calcium channel blocker. Think of it that way. If you don't have magnesium, calcium continually rushes into the cell and it becomes hyper irritable. These are people who can smell coffee and smell colognes, and then boom, they get a migraine headache. These are people that are very fidgety, they can't sleep, very, very fidgety, NMDA receptor. Look at magnesium as a possibility. Talking about neurotransmitters before, I was talking about acetylcholine, which is always excitatory at the neuromuscular junction. But I wanna talk about glutamate and GABA, which are two other neurotransmitters. And I talk about this because it relates to many students that I come into contact today. So glutamate is a neurotransmitter. Think of glutamate as the flower opening up in the morning. And then think of GABA as the sun goes down the flower closes. Glutamate gets converted to GABA. In the morning, when your alarm goes off, glutamate should be high. That allows you to get up, that allows you to do your things, spring into action, get everything done throughout the day, and then as nighttime comes, the break should hit, right? Glutamate is the accelerator or the gas pedal. GABA is more of calming effect neurotransmitter. So when glutamate is too high, you get anxiety, hyperactivity, impulsivity. People are constantly getting up in the middle of the night. There's movement and motor control issues with their muscle. There's this constant release of adrenaline from the adrenal glands, 
But when GABA is released, it's calm. There's better sleep. It's involved with better sensory integration, speech, language, right? When I speak and when I lecture, I try and communicate and speak slowly and clearly so that you can catch my words. It's involved with better processing. So glutamate and GABA is uh, very important. Glutamate is more of the accelerator. GABA is the break. If you can't go to bed, then that means you're glutamate dominant. That means there's more glutamate at night than GABA. If you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, snooze button, mm, can't get up, snooze button, then that means you're GABA dominant in the morning. And in order to convert glutamate to GABA, you need your B vitamins. You need B vitamin B6 and a little bit of B1 in order to do that. Okay. Let's look a little bit into calcitonin and PTH. So the three systems that are involved in regulating this calcium are the bones, the digestive tract, and the kidneys. The bones, you can either put calcium in bone or remove it from bone. If there's too much calcium in blood, we drive it in the bone. If there's too little calcium in the blood, we take it out of the bone. Digestive tract. If there's too little, we need to absorb more from your digestive tract. If we have too much, we turn it off. We don't need any more absorbed from your digestion. Kidneys. If you have too much calcium in the blood, we pee it out. If you have too little, then the nephron of the kidneys are affected in a way where it prevents the excretion of too much calcium. Look at the composition of bone, right? 99% of the body's calcium is in bone. 4% of the body's potassium is in bone. 50% of magnesium is in bone. 80% of carbonate, 99 of phosphate. So the bone is the bank, it's the reserve. But if you look at what else makes up bone, 33% of it comes from this protein called collagen. Now, when the body is chronically inflamed, remember those MMPs, the matrix metalloprotein aces? They're referred to as collagen ace or protein ACE, they're proteolytic or collagenolytic, they break down collagen. So one of the causes of osteoporosis could be chronic inflammation in the body, breaking down one third of bone. That's important. What vitamin do we need to make collagen? Remember vitamin C, and we don't manufacture it. So it's an essential vitamin, it has to be in your diet. So if you have low calcium level in your blood, your parathyroid gland is going to release PTH or parathyroid hormone. We want to find a way to take low calcium and to increase it. So we're going to stimulate osteoclast. It's going to break down bone to increase calcium. We're going to increase the absorption of calcium. So we need vitamin D in order to do that. And we are going to prevent the kidneys from peeing out additional calcium. So the kidneys, especially the nephron of the kidneys, will retain it. So that's the function of PTH, which comes from the parathyroid gland. If you have high calcium in the blood and we want to try and decrease it, it's going to use the same three systems, the bone, digestion, and kidney, except now, remember, we're trying to decrease calcium, so it's going to block the osteoclast, and it's going to enhance osteoblast. It's going to take some of that additional calcium and build bone. It's going to decrease the absorption of the uh, absorption from your digestive tract. We don't need any more. We don't need vitamin D to work as much. And here, the kidney and the nephron activates to release calcium from your urine to help decrease the amount of calcium in your bloodstream. So you should know the difference between calcitonin, which is released by the thyroid gland doing this, and the parathyroid gland releasing parathyroid hormone. You have to know the differences there. 
Okay, we spoke about Wolf's Law in terms of pulling and tension on the skeletal system is very important. If you don't use it, you lose it. We talked about astronauts um, and lack of weight bearing exercise being poor for your bone density. But if you put stress on the body, it helps to build up bone. Look at the difference between this woman here on top putting stress on her skeletal system. This is normal spongy bone here. We could see this elder woman and we could see the osteoporosis. We could see spongy bone looks very, very porous and weak. Okay. Who's at risk for osteoporosis? Those at risk are uh, white, thin, menopausal, smoking, drinking females with a family history. Also athletes who are not menstruating due to decreased body fat and decreased estrogen levels. Also eating disorders whose intake of calcium is too low. People with decreased vitamin D levels, vitamin K deficiencies. So the best thing to do is to have balanced, adequate diet. That's very important. And all the behaviors when you're young will be a benefit for you later in life. What's interesting about osteoporosis is that it used to be theorized that it's caused primarily by an estrogen deficiency, only by decreased estrogen. But what we're finding out today is that estrogen deficiency by itself doesn't necessarily guarantee osteoporosis. One of the newer theories that's being researched today is that it's decreased estrogen in the presence of this antigenic load, meaning putting things in your body that your body doesn't like and creating this immune reaction, this upregulation of immune cells. So we call it osteoimmunity. You can actually upregulate your immune system when the bones are being aggravated. So if your immune system is being challenged, then your bones are going to be breaking down quicker. So you want to make sure that you're not putting things into your body that shouldn't be there that's creating this antigenic load or allowing your body to attack it because it will attack it and the bones at the same time. Osteoporosis is visible on an x-ray after about 30% of the bone loss has, lo has been lost and patients become symptomatic when half the bone mass has been lost. And symptomatic is like grandma was walking, lost her balance and fell. It's usually the bone broke, grandma lost her balance and fell. It's usually how it happens. So some of the causes of osteoporosis, there are genetic factors, estrogen deficiencies, poor diet, high phosphate, low calcium. Look at Coca-Cola. What type of acid is in Coca-Cola? Phosphoric acid. Very, very dangerous. You got to be careful. And lots of sugar. Sugar is acidic. So you're adding phosphoric acid and sugar into that bone. It's going to pull out all the calcium. So here we look at this woman and now we say, well, she has this hyperkyphosis. Well, that's just structurally speaking. But what else does this woman have besides uh, osteoporosis or that bone softening? Think of what's happening to her lungs. If you have this concavity here and this hyperkyphosis, do you think her breathing is going to be normal? No. So if she's not breathing properly and she's not getting in enough oxygen, what's happening to her mitochondria? What's happening to her capability to produce energy? What's happening to her digestion? right? Look at the pelvis. Look at how cramped she is. What's happening to the digestive organs? What's happening to the ability not just to digest food, 
but to eliminate, elimination. Now bowel movements are poor, digestion is poor, oxygenation of the tissues are poor. Now, maybe it's osteoporosis from poor diet, maybe it's fair skin, maybe it's decreased vitamin D, poor calcium absorption, maybe she's not digesting enough protein to get collagen. Maybe she's taking antacids, decreasing the acids in the stomach so that she can't convert pepsinogen into pepsin to break down protein. When you use antacids, you can't break down protein in the stomach well, and you need collagen to build up bone. So there's so many different things that can cause this. So when a doctor looks at this and says, oh, you have osteoporosis, here's vitamin D, that's just one thing. Vitamin D deficiencies can create this, but it's just one thing. There's so many others. Maybe it's chronic inflammation. Maybe the bones are breaking down because she's chronically inflamed. This is what it looks like on an X-ray. This is osteoporosis. When the vertebrae itself starts to look like the same density of what's outside of it, so this density and this density look the same, that's osteoporosis. And then look at this vertebra. See how in the back, this is looking at someone from the side view, laterally, the posterior part is wide, and then it starts to narrow down in the front. So you get this wedge. You get this wedge. And when you get this wedge, everything starts to become hyperkyphotic and you get that hump on the back. This is normal, healthy vertebra. This is osteoporosis. This is where you get those compression fractures. Rickets and osteomalacia, similar things. They just happen at different ages. Rickets happens in children. Osteomalacia is bone softening that happens in adults. When children have rickets, you don't see their legs like this. You see their legs bowing and they get bow-leggedness. That's because the legs are struts. They keep the body upright. But if there's too much weight-bearing pressure, the struts are going to bend and you get bow-leggedness. Osteomalacia happens in adults. It's when there's faulty bone remodeling in adults. It's called osteomalacia. Okay, we spoke about these vitamins and minerals before and their relationship to bone. We did speak about these hormones and exercise in relationship to bones. So that brings that to a close. Let me stop the screen share and stop the recording there.